This video was made possible by Wix. If you are ready to create a website, head over to wix.com slash go slash infographics to try out one of their premium plans right now. The year is 1989, and in just two years, the Soviet Union and its mighty Warsaw Pact would collapse politically, seeing an end to the Cold War and a de facto NATO victory. But what would have happened if the Soviet Union had seen its own coming demise and made a desperate bid to defeat NATO? The rules of this war game will include no use of nuclear weapons and assume that China, with simmering hostilities against the Soviet Union, remain neutral, limiting the conflicts to strictly the Soviet Union, its Warsaw Pact allies, and NATO. Overall, the Warsaw Pact enjoyed a numerological advantage over NATO in most military categories except naval forces, with a standing force of 6 million active duty personnel versus NATO's 4.5 million active duty personnel. The Warsaw Pact also had an advantage in number of tanks, approximately 70,000 versus NATO's 50,000, although NATO had twice as many modern tanks. 5,300, mostly American M1 Abrams, German Leopard 2s, and British Challengers, versus 2,600 Soviet T-80s. NATO tanks had better computers and sensors, which would have made them lethal in nighttime fighting, but sheer numbers would have been on the Warsaw Pact side, with the bulk of its forces being made up of older T-80B, T-72B, and T-64B models, which still had the punch to knock out even a modern NATO tank. The largest advantage enjoyed by the Warsaw Pact was in the realm of artillery, with over 45,000 artillery pieces versus NATO's 18,000. Though NATO's forces were on the whole technologically superior to the Warsaw Pact, the overwhelming amount of artillery on the communist side would have severely blunted that advantage via fire suppression alone. In the air, the Warsaw Pact also outnumbered NATO with 14,000 planes versus NATO's 11,000. NATO, however, fielded far more modern planes, enjoyed better missile technology, and pilots had an order of magnitude more training flight hours per year, 180 hours versus 120 hours or less. The Warsaw Pact countered these advantages with a huge deployment of ground-based SAM batteries, as seen in wars of the period from Vietnam to conflicts versus Israel, Soviet anti-air missile systems enjoyed an average kill rate of 3 to 5 percent, which while not great, the sheer number of SAM systems employed by the Warsaw Pact, about 1400, would have posed a significant challenge to NATO air forces. So how would a potential war have played out? Despite its firepower advantages, the Soviet Union and allies knew that they would never win in a protracted war of attrition versus NATO, who outclassed them in sheer economic might with a combined GDP of approximately 12 trillion US dollars versus the Warsaw Pact's 2.5 trillion. Therefore, any war would have to be quick, with projections at the time showing that a multi-year conflict would eventually result in a complete NATO victory. With focus on a quick and decisive campaign, the Soviet Union would immediately launch an offensive across the German front while putting Warsaw Pact forces in Romania and Bulgaria on a defensive footing to prevent a flanking maneuver by Italian, Greek, or Turkish forces. Though Greek and Turkish forces alone outnumbered Bulgarian and Romanian forces by 2 to 1, difficult terrain and a lack of decisive numerological advantage would have favored a defensive battle for the Bulgarians and Romanians. On Turkey's eastern front, the Caucasus were a natural barrier to land invasion into the Soviet Union, and a force of approximately 100,000 Soviet soldiers could have easily held against a Turkish attack thanks to the difficult terrain. An attempt to flank these forces over the Black Sea would have been catastrophic due to the presence of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet. So instead of joining a European offensive, Turkey would have been tasked with keeping the Black Sea Fleet bottled up to prevent it from reaching the Mediterranean. Trying to break out of the Black Sea would have spelled complete disaster for the Soviets, as they would have been forced to try to break through Turkish defenses on the narrow Bosphorus Strait. In the end, most of the fighting would have remained in Germany, though the longer the war continued, the more US naval reinforcements would arrive, and with access to the Black Sea firmly in Turkish control, the decimation of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet would be a foregone conclusion, allowing Turkey to land forces at Odessa and Sevastopol, and opening a second front in the Soviet Union's vulnerable southern border. Initially, though, Soviet forces would quickly overwhelm NATO defenses in Germany. On the eve of war, Soviet forces would open with a withering ballistic and air-launched cruise missile attack against West Germany's air bases. With about 1,500 ballistic missile launchers, and most of them near the front, the majority of NATO's airfields in West Germany would be quickly rendered useless and require days to repair. However, this would not put as big a dent in NATO's ability to launch sorties as the Soviets hoped, as NATO planes had on average 25-50% to 50 greater range than Soviet planes, 
and 88% of all NATO fighters had in-air refueling capabilities versus approximately 3% of Soviet fighters. With better and more fuel-efficient engines along with a robust aerial tanker fleet, NATO planes were designed for long-range sorties exactly because of the vulnerability of West German airfields to sudden Soviet offenses and missile strikes. In the first week of the war, NATO would be pushed back dozens of miles by overwhelming Soviet firepower. With most of its forces stationed near West Germany, the Warsaw Pact could funnel more troops faster than NATO to the front, who would have to mobilize forces from Great Britain, Spain, Portugal, and the US. With the US holding the majority of NATO's firepower, it would take 15 days minimum to deploy the first American light infantry brigades into Europe, so the Soviets would enjoy a two-week decisive advantage over NATO. Yet their offensive would be slowed by the natural terrain of Germany, which features dozens of rivers, and the influx of troops along with a mass civilian exodus would congest roads also slowing down the Soviet advance. Soviet military doctrine would further slow down an offensive, as their units featured very few logistical support personnel, as it was Soviet thinking at the time that most units would be entirely decimated and would simply be replaced by new units, as supply lines lengthened a lack of logistics personnel would have been a critical vulnerability and caused even more slowdowns of the Soviet advance. In the air, neither side would enjoy much success initially. NATO planes would have been able to target and fire on Soviet planes from much longer distances, but Soviet planes were generally better at close quarters dogfighting. Unclassified Soviet documents show that though initially the Soviet Union thought it could win an air supremacy war, by 1985, and eclipsed technologically by NATO, Soviet doctrine shifted to focusing air power in smaller areas rather than trying to establish theater-wide supremacy. This would have tied up Soviet fighters in specific geographic areas, protecting them from NATO attack but would also prevent them from launching strikes against NATO logistical facilities or troop formations, leaving NATO troops free to resupply and ready for counterattacks. The Soviet Union would instead have relied on its overwhelming SAM air defense advantage, but most of their platforms were not very mobile and would have taken days to weeks to reach the front. American stealth aircraft such as the F-117 would prove to be stunningly effective against Soviet-built air defenses in Desert Storm just two years later, but it would take time to move them to the European theater from their US bases and would be too few in number to decisively alter the course of the war on their own. In the North Atlantic, the Soviet fleet would operate under a fortress fleet doctrine, keeping close to their coastal fire support and acting as a defensive measure against sea invasions by NATO. A string of seafloor sensors and coordinated anti-submarine assets made a nearly impenetrable wall across Greenland, Iceland, and the UK for Soviet subs, leaving American reinforcements with little threat of attack as they crossed the Atlantic. The Soviet Union might attempt a surprise invasion of Iceland in order to break the anti-submarine defense line, but only at the risk of leaving key Barents Sea naval facilities defenseless against NATO invasion, threatening the German front and presenting an unacceptable risk. NATO forces would likely attempt a land offensive across the northern tip of Norway in a bid to open a second front and relieve pressure in Germany, but heavy snow and mountainous terrain would make any advance slow and difficult while greatly favoring the Soviet defenders. On the other side of the world, the Soviet Union would face considerable threat from US forces in the Pacific who would attempt offensives against Kamachka. While far less strategically important to the war effort due to its economically developed nature, a land invasion of Eastern Soviet Union would provide a corridor for offenses into the heart of the nation. The Soviets would thus be forced to divert manpower from the European front to fend off an American invasion. Having signed a mutual defense treaty with the US, Japan would provide a fortified base of operation for an American invasion, and though unable to mount offensives on its own due to the self-defense nature of its military, Japanese forces could eventually reinforce American Americans making landfall in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Pacific Fleet would also operate under a fortress fleet doctrine, keeping close to a coastal firepower as it could not match the US Navy. With five supercarriers in the Pacific, the US would eventually succeed in making landfall in Kamachka, though only at great cost to its naval and marines both. Ending the first year of the war, the Soviet Union and its allies would have seized the majority of Germany and this would have presented the most opportune time to bid for a ceasefire, hoping for a lack of will to continue fighting from NATO nations. Though both sides would have all but exhausted their air forces, it would have provided an opportunity for NATO industry to replace its entire inventory with wholly modern fighters and strike aircraft, completely swinging the balance of power in the air and leaving Soviet forces vulnerable. 
facing a combined economic might over three times greater than its own, and with new fronts opening up in its vulnerable Pacific coast, if the Soviet Union could not force peace by year's end, it would have faced certain defeat. Still, win or lose, by year's end, war between the Soviet Union and NATO would have casualties reaching in the millions. A second year's worth of fighting may have seen casualty numbers higher than in any other one-year period of fighting in history, making a Soviet Union-NATO war the most deadly in human history. Even with NATO's ability to win a long-term conflict, the cost of pushing deep into Warsaw Pact territory would have been prohibitive and an end to the war would simply have seen old borders restored at the cost of tens of millions of soldiers and hundreds of millions of direct and indirect civilian casualties, begging the question of who in the end could ultimately claim victory. Luckily, not every question in life is this serious. So do you know who you would choose for your website provider? We suggest Wix. Wix is a professional and robust platform for creating, managing, and hosting your website. With Wix, you'll never have to worry if your website is safe and secure, or if it will go down because of some hypothetical scenario we can't even think of right now. Best of all, Wix offers you true creative freedom when designing your website. If you want to create a website about those crazy serial killers out there, Wix has a solution for you. If you want to create a website to show off your new hobby, Wix has a solution for you as well. Create that website that you've been thinking about and support the infographic show at the same time by going to wix.com co infographics or by clicking the link in the description. So. Who do you think would win in the NATO-Soviet Union showdown? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called Russian Soldiers vs. American Soldiers. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time!